Hey, everybody. So session two here, and we are going to be talking about the theme of the wisdom of God. I'm sorry, the kingdom of God. That's where we are meant to be. And this will take us to our second lesson of the first unit. So just in case I didn't mention this on the first week, I'm going to try to do this one lesson at a time and go in lesson order, not so much as if we were live and in session doing this, that we would go, be going theme by theme and then kind of leave it to you to follow my clues as to where exactly these lessons fall in line. I figure it would be just a little bit better to do it for you that way. So anyway, would say maybe a loose title of this lesson could be the king has all authority. Now, I know it's a little busy on the screen, but I just want you to appreciate, and I'm going to go back here to the slide that shows us the scripture passage we're looking at here, and that's Matthew 22, 23 through 46, which if you notice on the bottom left corner of the screen, starting with this second green box, the temptation to test God's character. Uh, and if you notice there in the blocks beside the orange and green, I've actually included for you several scripture references. But in the second green and third green box is the actual portion of scripture where our lesson will be coming from. But what I've tried to do here is actually take the preceding chapter of Matthew 21, where Jesus gives us three parables. And it's actually conducive to look at it this way, I think, for the sake of consistency, because in understanding that chapter's context, which leads over into the beginning of chapter 22, when we get down into these three different temptations that's levied against Jesus here, we're seeing, I think, some matching going on. And there's some contextual clues that give that to us, and we'll touch on that a little bit. So what I'm hoping to help you see here is that there seems to be, through the giving of these parables, a mirroring effect in these temptations that these various groups, Pharisees, Sadducees, and so forth, are trying to bring against Jesus in order to trap him, all right? Because, of course, every one of these who were bringing these uh, temptations against Jesus are indeed Israelites, and that's the subject and character of what's going on here in these preceding parables. So if that doesn't make sense yet, if we work through the first one together, I think it just might. So in Matthew 21, verses 28 through 32, we have the parable of the two sons. Now, with that, Jesus is asking the question with respect to one son. We have one son who says to his father, I will go and do everything you have said, but then the son does not go and do it. Then the other son says to his father, no, I won't do what you've told me, but then goes out and does it. Jesus says, which of these two sons in the end did the will of his father? And they said, well, the one who actually went and did the thing. And Jesus says, well, that's the reason why tax collectors and prostitutes are entering into the kingdom before you. So we go to the first purple box where we understand that Israel in this is pictured here as the rebellious son, the one who said he would do, but of course did not accomplish the will of his father. Now, in this parable here, we have an understanding that Yahweh's relationship is postured as father to son. And in that, the kingdom is indeed a place of labor, a place where work is to be done. There is a will that the father has set forth by, be by means of an agenda. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 <laughs> and the first three verses that Abraham's people are supposed to influence the nations. They're supposed to change the world. And so with that, he has been forecasting what that agenda looks like. And now in the time of the servant, the very one that Isaiah has predicted would come, and many of the other prophets have talked about using various different titles and so forth, has now arrived on the scene. They have the option to either get in line with this, or they can find themselves missing out. They will indeed wind up losing the kingdom by virtue of that. So we parallel that over against the first temptation that's brought against Jesus, which is not yet part of our host text, but it comes directly before it <clears throat> with the temptation to rebel against Caesar. So with that, we have them bringing a coin to Jesus and asking, you know, are we to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, part of it is actually addressing one of Israel's chief's prob chief problems, and that is their relationship with Rome. This is a, an infighting that's going on between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, actually, because the Sadducees, as is made amply clear to us in the New Testament, are those who do not believe in the resurrection. There is no life after this, that you have what you have here and now, and that existence is part of what is the only part of what you will ever know and understand of God's kingdom. And by virtue of that, uh, they want to get all they can and have all that they can. And with that means they have to sympathize with Rome because if they don't play nice with Rome, Rome's only going to bring torment upon them and they'll lose their station, their power, authority, and with that, all their wealth. And what they understand of life and the only existence they have here and now will be forfeit. It will be that of one miserly, beggarly existence. It's clearly not what they want. It's the reason the Sadducees are amongst the more wealthier. Whereas the Pharisees clearly do not believe that. 
And with that, they do not have any desire to want to sympathize with Rome. And of course, you have other sects like the Sicarii and the Zealots and whatnot who all want to just kill the Romans, even if it means doing so at the cost of their own lives. But with this, in a sense, it's actually kind of going back to the original temptation that Jesus had to endure at the hands of Satan out in the wilderness. So it's like he's being retested yet again here. And with that first temptation that Satan lauded, the idea of making bread from the stones, this presents a challenge to be obedient in authority. It was a challenge to be obedient in authority by Jesus uh, deciding, okay, who am I actually going to submit to? I could do this myself, but I choose not to. Instead, as was said by Moses to our ancestors in Deuteronomy, I'm going to live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That's what I'm dependent upon. I'm not going to satisfy my own needs by virtue of seizing authority for myself, the very sin of Adam. And in this case, it's a submission of authority to Rome. That's what they're testing him on. Is he going to submit himself to Rome? Is he going to make a public statement that will let everybody know where his loyalties actually lie? And by virtue of that, we can discredit him in the eyes of his followers who think that he's supposed to be Messiah because we all know Messiah is going to be the one that leads the uh, Rome or Israel to Rome's defeat. Now you might say, well, what does this have to do with the parable of the two sons? Well, again, it's all about a submission to authority here. The two sons have to ultimately decide whether or not they will submit to their father's authority and do what their father has said. In this case, there's going to have to be a measure of submission to Rome, but Jesus pictures it perfectly when he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. This is Caesar's money. So the money that you make, give what Caesar demands of you. But by virtue of this, understand that everything that you are and have is God's. So give to God what is God's. That is all of you. And again, everything that he gives you stewardship over. So you have to fall in line and submit yourself to him because he is the king who has all authority. And by virtue of that, the one who sits at his right hand, his son, shares in that authority. He rules as co-regent, as king alongside him. Therefore, this king that you see standing before you has all authority. Now we go to the next orange box and the next parable of Matthew 21, the parable of the vineyard owner. Now we're all familiar with this, or we should be. And that is, of course, the progression of the tenant farmers and how they treat the servants whom the vineyard owner is sending back into the vineyard to receive his portion of what is rightfully uh, his due crop and so forth. But of course, they don't want to give it to the servants. They beat some, they kill others, and eventually the owner decides, I'll send my son. There's no way they would treat my son like that. And by virtue of that, they wind up killing the son outside of the vineyard. So in this second blue box, Yahweh's relationship to Israel is owner to tenant. See, the kingdom is a place of fruitfulness, and the idea is that the owner of the vineyard has every right, hence the reason why we constantly see the imagery of the fig tree being used in the Gospels, and Jesus even using it in parable forms, or outright cursing a fig tree that's meant to represent Israel and say, no fruit will ever grow on you again, and within a day, it's withered. The idea is that the kingdom is supposed to be a place of fruitfulness. It's pictured by what the prophets said when they're speaking of how God plucked up a vine out of Egypt, that is Israel removed out of Egypt. He planted it in the land of Canaan. It was supposed to overtake that garden space that he had plowed up by removing the inhabitants of Canaan to place them there. Instead, it becomes a vineyard filled with wild, sour tasting grapes. And by virtue of that, this vineyard has to be destroyed, i.e. the Babylonian exile, which now they've come back out of. And that's the, the nature of the Israel that Jesus lives in. So this leads us to the second temptation that Jesus endures at the hands of these question seekers and askers. But this is actually the beginning of our host text uh, that we'll be reading for this lesson. And so with it, <clears throat> we have the idea of the Sadducees coming and asking Jesus, hey, so we have an example here of seven different brothers who were all married to the same wife. And in the great resurrection that's going to happen at the end of time, whose wife will she be? And Jesus tells them, you clearly do not understand who God is or his power. And uh, you, it's obvious because you don't even read the scriptures, right? Because you only attest to the first five books of Moses and everything beyond that, that clearly testifies to the idea of life beyond the grave. But I'll even take you back to the beginning of scripture with respect to the story of Moses talking to the Lord at the burning bush. And you clearly see he's the God of the living, not the dead. But second black box, this is another one of Israel's chief problems, and that is their understanding of eschatology, at least as far as the Sadducees are concerned, but even the uh, Pharisees excuse me, largely get it wrong, but the Sadducee understanding of Yahweh. But in a way, this also mirrors the second testing of Jesus by Satan in the wilderness, like the test of Satan. That's perhaps a challenge as to who knows the nature of God better. Do the Sadducees? I mean, after all, 
the Sadducees comprised mostly or is comprised mostly of the priestly class. So these people are the ones who were charged by the Lord in the Old Testament for the words to Aaron in Leviticus 10. Your job is to teach Israel the difference between holy and unholy, profane and uh, clean. By virtue of that, the Levites are all supposed to, also supposed to be the ones who continue to remind people of God's word. They are implemented at a few points in the Old Testament as being the ones who go literally house to house in the days of Josiah and teach the people the covenant words of the Lord. And the Levites are also used by Ezra and others in that uh, setting in Nehemiah chapter 8, where they are teaching the people of the Lord as they read the law aloud day after day. So they have a very pivotal role in helping people understand what the entirety of God's words are. For some reason in the time in between the Babylonian exile up until the days of Jesus, the class of the Sadducees became a, a separate party. And by virtue of that, the priests decided to throw themselves whole lot, uh, whole lot and sell in with them. And by virtue of that, embrace that idea of eschatology with respect to the only authoritative books are Moses's words. And by virtue of that, there is no life after the grave. But Jesus is clearly saying, as he did to Moses, I'm sorry, to uh, Satan in the wilderness with respect to, hey, so isn't it said in the Psalms that if you were to fall, he won't let you dash your foot against a stone? So I'll tell you what, taking you out of the temple, why don't you jump on down? Let's test that theory. And Jesus says, no, no, you, you do not test the Lord your God. <clears throat> and so he knows the nature of God better. And clearly that's what he's drawing out here with respect to the Sadducees, that he knows the character of God better. And they should listen to the authority of all of Scripture with respect to what God is saying and revealing about himself. And if they did, and they would perhaps understand him better. This is part of the reason why many priests will become believers as we read through how the fallout of the Jesus movement continues on after his ascension in the book of Acts, as again, Pharisees and priests were becoming believers. But let's attach this back to the vineyard owner because the Sadducees clearly can't produce the fruit that they were meant to. And this is part of the reason why they continue to persecute all those who have been sent before them, the various servants that lead up to eventually the son who comes. And part of the reason why these Sadducees before Many of them will repent of their sin in betraying Jesus and rejecting him as their Messiah to then wind up becoming perhaps part of that movement who will believe and follow him in the book of Acts. First, they are going to kill him by virtue of what they think they know of God and that this would actually be pleasing to God rather than let this blasphemer, this Nazarene carpenter who fancies himself Messiah, continue to speak. And by virtue of that, they will temporarily um, for those, uh, I say temporarily, for those who may have been part of the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin that initially approved of rejecting and killing Jesus and repent of it later in the book of Acts, or, of course, permanently by virtue of those who never repent of their sin and continue on in their rejection of Jesus, even after the gospel is presented to them over and over again. Now, last and final orange box and last parable of Matthew 22 that we're focusing on, the parable of the wedding banquet. So, of course, the idea here is that invitations are sent out to everyone on the king's invitee list, but they all find excuses for why they won't come. And through multiple iterations, we have the king telling his servants to now go out and compel those in the streets, then eventually the highways and byways, as far out as you can go. And everyone who was originally invited is disinvited. And by virtue of that, they wind up losing the kingdom. So Yahweh's relationship to Israel is king to guests, and the kingdom, of course, is pictured here as a wedding feast. The whole kingdom in its existence is pictured as a wedding feast. Hence all the, the references that Jesus makes when he says, you will find yourselves in a great place of sorrow when you see those from the east and the west coming to sit at the king's table and dining in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but you find yourselves cast out of it. It's a progression. The idea that, of course, those from the east and the west will continue to come in and sit down at the table and dine while those who have rejected the kingdom and had it removed from them and their invitation revoked are going to perpetually find themselves on the outside. And as Paul was saying in Romans, provoked jealousy. Now, moving this over to the last temptation given to the king here is to test the loyalty to the king. Temptation given to the king and his loyalty to the ultimate king. And it's much in the same that we get with Jesus's third and final temptation at the hands of Satan, who said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you would simply bow down and worship me. See, that's part of Israel's chief problem. Their relation to Torah and understanding Yahweh's kingdom requirements and ultimately giving their obedience and loyalty to him rather than to themselves. Because that's always been the problem with respect to Adam and whatnot, as goes the idea of, 
who is the real king, right? He rejects the king in Genesis 3 to become his own king and define the kingdom by his own parameters, which is clearly something that God will have nothing to do with. And by virtue of that, he rejects Adam. Now, the story of scripture goes on to see the restoration of this kingdom. And of course, image bearers is the part of the process as God brings the ultimate king into existence, incarnated in human flesh, uh, that being the second member of the Trinity. But the point I make in all of this is simply, as they test uh, Jesus here with respect to what is said in this particular passage, what they are asking here is, what are the greatest commands? And Jesus says, of course, the greatest commands is to love the Lord your God with every fiber of your being. The second is uh, almost equal to it, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And the idea is, where does Jesus's loyalty lie? Because if he elevates any additional command over another, he is going to be violating the various schools of thought as goes Rabbi Shale uh, Hillel or Shemai and all of their delineated teachings with respect to marriage and various other things, super uh, conservative or super liberal. And of course, with that, it would, like we do today with political parties, divide his followers as to who exactly he aligns himself with. Because many have probably been guessing up until this point, who exactly does Jesus seem to favor more? But in, <laughs> irrespective and regardless to all of that, as Jesus finds no relevancy in any of those things, he's telling them the clear and simple understanding is, is that you have been given revelation and you have been given the invitation to come into the kingdom. It's not about who you find loyalty to or amongst outside of the king who you pledged yourself to in covenant relationship through your ancestors back in Exodus 24. And now you're being called to that again and a new and greater covenant now given the one who was amongst you. So the idea is that as they test him with respect to what are the greatest commands, and as Satan was already, uh, Jesus was already tested by Satan before in the wilderness, Jesus is showing himself who he's ultimately allegiant to, the high king, and they are to find themselves allegiant to the high king, not by following these rote commands that they've made for themselves. How many steps do you get to take on a Sabbath? What constitutes work? Do you have to wash a vessel? that you have placed certain types of meat on before you eat off of it. You have to wash your hands when you come out of the marketplace because Gentiles are there or any of these silly things. And by virtue of not doing them, you're considered sinful. But rather what the scriptures say, how do you love the Lord your God? How do you treat your neighbor? And if you're not doing that, you don't belong to the king. You're not part of his kingdom. And like those who of the previous parable of Matthew 22, you will find yourselves rejected and having your invitation revoked. While those you thought never would qualify for the kingdom are the ones sitting at the table you thought you were sitting at. So hopefully that's helpful as you go back and deconstruct the content of Matthew 22 late in that chapter and come to understand perhaps a little better what's going on there as it's contiguous with Matthew 21. All right, more to come. Thanks for listening.